The Lifeboat Hour with Michael Rupert, Sundays at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on the Progressive Radio Network. Mike Rupert, I'm back again with you for one more week, although uh, I do have to say honestly that I am at the point where I have to say now uh, each succeeding week could be the last one, uh, and I think my guest tonight will agree with me. We have uh, Dmitry Orlov back tonight. It's, I have, have some news to do before that, uh, but we're going to talk about a lot of important things tonight, like there's no tomorrow, because who knows. Uh, we got tremendous feedback from every from around the world on Facebook uh, over last week's show with Derek Jensen. I want to thank Derek again for coming on. Uh, what was interesting, though, in this uh, in this climate of war that we live in, is that uh, the uh, PRN radio archives were uh, <laughs> taken offline, and iTunes was involved, and uh, a lot of people didn't get to hear the show. Uh, PRN stepped up to the plate. I'm not quite sure how that played out, but the last I heard. Uh, they were calling lawyers, but that this is this is how nasty the world is now, and and uh, it, it's apparent that the flow of information is is, is critical to everyone. The, the, the battle that's being waged now is is the battle for human consciousness, uh, and so uh, you know uh, we are on that field for sure. I want to thank all of my Facebook friends this week. You have just we we are really developing a good network across many platforms with CollapseNet and being able to tweet and share, and we're trying to maximize all of this, but uh, I want to give a special thanks to all of my loyal friends on Facebook who also are scanning the world for stories uh, and uh, have made some very good catches. Uh, one is, this is a great piece of good, really, really good news. It's not a fairy tale. Uh, Seattle is to build the nation's first food forest, and this, uh, this, uh, we have this uh, on the homepage at CollapseNet right now. And uh, Seattle has uh, taken a large public park, and, there, and food forests uh, are a form of permaculture uh, where uh, literally one approach is to use seed balls to throw clusters of kind of related seeds and uh, plants that do well together uh, and uh, make each other stronger. And a food forest can literally produce in a very small space uh, enormous amounts of edible food, uh, very healthy, very organic, and Seattle is a great place to do that. Uh, but uh, I read this story today, and I actually cried. Um, and uh, as I put the comment uh, up on uh, uh, the homepage at CollapseNet uh, with the homepage breaking news story, uh, the hundredth monkey approaches, uh, and I give thanks. I mean, so many people will live because of this, and the fact that other cities and people will share this story will help um, the lights go on for a great many. And uh, here's one other story that... Uh, uh, that that uh, somebody put up on Facebook. Wyoming doomsday bill advances in state house. Huffington Post. Here's the quote: Wyoming lawmakers pushed forward legislation to explore how the state would respond if the country fell into economic and political turmoil. The so-called doomsday bill passed in the Wyoming House on Friday would create a special task force to study ways the state would handle such crises as food shortage, to, uh, food food shortage to a government shutdown. Some provisions that will be explored include Wyoming forming its own army and issuing its own currency. It's official now, I guess. This is my comment that uh, uh, there is even go governmental recognition of zombie apocalypse. No shit. The term was actually in the story, and it's in the government documents. So there you go, folks. You know, I don't know what it takes. Uh, some folks are starting to talk about this now, and this is uh, this is another major milestone for all of the hundredth. Uh, for, for all of us, that hundredth monkey is, is really sniffing around here somewhere. So uh, I have a special thanks tonight for all of you who have responded uh, to CollapseNet's call for help. Uh, you know that we had uh, some very major orchestrated governmental type uh, cyber attacks, uh, and we had to switch, and we went off two months uh, for two months. Uh, 
the people who make Collapse Network had, had gone without their very meager pay. We only have them on as independent contractors, and some were getting 250 a week, and some, uh, you know, a little more. But uh, for some, it was all they had, like for so many now. And everybody has worked for two months, uh, almost everybody, without pay. Uh, but thanks to all of you, uh, but especially to one friend, and, and uh, Collapse Net and, and I have had some other great benefactors and gift givers and angels along the way but there's one who i really want to thank and he's my good friend sean yem in hong kong he's probably listening tonight and i send uh, my deepest affection to his family uh, and to him uh and as a result of his generosity and, and, and everyone else all of the people who have gone without money at collapse net to keep kicking ass like we're doing um have been caught up and uh, that's a great feeling for for me and for our uh, Chief Operating Officer Wes Miller. So thanks to all of you. We're still in here. Um, so now, a summary of what's happening in oil prices. I, 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 now I can just hear Dimitri kind of starting to grin in the background. Uh, I like to torture him this way. Um, summary of what's happening in oil prices. This is the quote of the year. There's a, a writer named John Robb from the Global Gorilla. We had him up on the world's new news desk today. But, quote, this is shaping up to be an amazingly violent global heart attack exactly um it is uh, peak oil has been so abundantly and overwhelmingly confirmed in spades uh and uh yeah, press tv from iran even ran, ran a uh, clip this week that was almost exactly like like the analysis i had given on peak oil uh the u.s is in full retreat overseas uh, on all fronts um, uh, two american officers were assassinated inside the interior ministry <clears throat> Taliban claimed credit, but it was a member of the Afghan military. It's open season on Americans. Um, seven more hurt today. Uh, uh, our foreign policy stuff is failing across the board, et cetera, et cetera. We all know that. Uh, but oil prices are skyrocketing. They're, they're increasing uh, faster than has ever been recorded. They are the highest ever for this time of the year, 426 here in Sebastopol. What is it where you are? Uh, highest ever in Europe, and that's, of course, killing everything and everybody. We are at that point. Uh, from the movie Collapse, uh, where I said, uh, it will come when oil spikes again, and nobody can afford to buy that oil. Everything will just shut down. That's where we are. And in Greece, uh, here's a quote from a story we had on the World News Desk. As per the new agreement, Greece's lenders will have the right to seize the country's gold reserves in the event of any default. Greek gold reserves are estimated to be more than 100 tons. Also hard-hitting to its national interest is the fact that all future issues of Greek bonds will be governed in English and Luxembourg courts, conditions more favorable to the bondholders. Ladies and gentlemen, everybody around the world, and we know now that our listeners come from all over the world. We know that our listeners here and the people who come to us on CollapseNet are often world leaders. We see that, we know that, we have seen all the responses. A nation is being dismembered and eaten alive in front of 7 billion pairs of eyes. Even a herd of deer, cattle, or sheep is smart enough to run and to seek shelter when one of its members is taken by a wolf or a mountain lion. We are the 99%. This shit has got to end. One more little thing here before we get down to Dimitri in a second. The yen, and I've been telling you on CollapseNet for a long time that Japan is mortally wounded. Well, that uh, Japan's falling over moment is right now. Uh, and the, the yen is absolutely tanking as uh, Japanese manufacturers flee the country. They've got an, uh, another reactor now leaking. They've lost uh, all of this. Uh, but uh, Japan is now hobbled for the first time in 30 years, running a trade surplus. Uh, it's manufacturers that can hobbled by a lack of electricity, electricity or fleeing. Uh, and uh, food crops as far away as Okinawa, way down south, are now contaminated with radiation. And I wrote, this is all being coordinated and choreographed according to a timetable. Dimitri and I will be discussing that tonight. Uh, Europe will go down because of debt. The U.S. will go down over oil and debt, and Japan will take the huge leap downward at about the same time, which looks to be between March and May of this year. Iraq is being ripped apart by al-Qaeda uh, and the Saudis, CIA, Mossad, and MI6. Uh, it's a civil war. The fault lies in the boundaries that were drawn in Iraq on the map by Winston Churchill at the end of the First World War. 
the only rational approach that uh, adheres with natural laws to as best as possible, allow the pre-existing cultural regions to congeal in whatever forms emerge, but, to, but correctly aligned geographically and historically. Um, as collapse proceeds, uh, geography will trump everything. Um, and Chicago, uh, setting the stage, Occupy is coming back very strong. It needs to. Of course, the world's you know, also rioting and everything else. Everybody's going to be going crazy here next week, I think. But Chicago, NATO, and the G8 are meeting in May. <clears throat> and uh, NATO and the G8 in the same place at the same time. That's a gauntlet thrown, and, and uh, uh, it really looks like uh, everybody's going to be responding. Uh, that's the, the uh, place to be come May. However, there's a part of me that is wondering tonight if we have until May before a set of conditions preventing travel or anything else uh, comes down crashing around us. But that's the subject, because all of these things now seem to be happening at the same time when many of them should have happened a while ago. So we need some help talking about that. And tonight we have Dmitry Orlov. You all know him. He's a Russian-American engineer. He's a writer. Um, he moved to the U.S. at uh, the age of 12, but he was in Russia, the USSR, for the collapse. He has a B.S. and an M.A. in applied linguistics, uh, and, he, and uh, he's an amazing writer. In 2005, 2006, uh, Dmitry wrote a number of Orlov uh, of articles comparing the collapse preparedness of the U.S. and the Soviet Union, and we were the first to publish him uh, at From the Wilderness, I believe, in uh, June of 2005. You can find uh, Dmitry at Club. He's the author of Reinventing Collapse, and he's Dmitry Orlov. Uh, you can find him at Club Orlov. Let me try this again. It's, it's the Russian thing. You can find him at cluborlov.blogspot.com. If there's anybody else I wanted to hang out with tonight, it's Dimitri. Welcome back, dude. Mike, good to be on your show. Oh, how tired are you, man? Oh, I'm not tired. I've, uh, I'm in fine shape. Not good. Well, I've been working hard this week trying to keep up with everything that's going on. But uh, I saw you recently on Max Kaiser. And uh, and I had started saying back around August, uh, when it was obvious that Greece was going to default, it had to default, and, and we have seen this choreographed dog and pony, now cliched, uh, dance going on. And a great many things led me to conclude that everything was being choreographed. Then uh, Zero Hedge found some documents from Gold, Goldman Sachs that said all of these great big events are being choreographed. And then I saw you on Max Kaiser make pretty much the same statement. Can you expand on that more? Yeah, I, I don't think that it's uh, it's actually choreography. I, I, I think that, you know, there's too much incompetence in what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I do think that, uh, that there is this uh, process of knocking countries over. Uh, it's what's called the IMF riot. It's, uh, it's a particular way of destroying countries uh, that the, the global financial elite has been practicing on third world countries. The interesting thing is that this pattern is now spreading to Europe, southern yeah. Europe. Okay. And uh, eventually will engulf the entire planet, but the thing is that you can't just have Cayman Islands and the rest of the world in flames. Mm -hmm. That doesn't work. So at some point it'll stop working. The interesting thing for me is to figure out when that will happen. Well, there, there has been uh, a, a, a dramatic acceleration, uh, from my perspective, of uh, the rate of collapse uh, over the last two months or so, <clears throat> which seems to be made much more aggressive now that, that, that I'm seeing a power shift, a, a massive power shift from west to east and the complete full awareness of peak oil while the U.S. can't see it. Or Yes, well, uh, I, I think that, you know, that the pattern that, I predicted that was borne out to some extent is that uh, every time the, the global economy attempts to grow, uh, oil prices will spike right. and, and then cause another round of recession. Well, I believe I'll, I'll have to retract that because there's no sign that you know the global economy is trying to grow, but the, the oil prices are spiking anyway. So I think the new normal is that if the global economy is collapsing too slowly, then oil prices spike. It has uh, to faster now. Oh, only, 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 okay. Take that for a second. If it's collapsing too slowly, for whom? For what? Uh, for for the oil-producing nations. 
Aha, okay. So that, that okay, that uh, this would mesh perfectly with an article we had from the Wilderness in about 2002, I think, from by Dale Allen Pfeiffer, who's the guy who in, in, introduced me to you, mm-hmm. uh, saying that, uh, you know, as we got in, in, into this stage of peak oil, that OPEC would become dominant. Uh, and I think Iran is absolutely proving that because, number one, uh, the, the whole world has proved that there is no, nowhere else to go to, to replace that oil. The, the Saudis are about to be exposed. Uh, but Iran's clearly flexing its power. So wh- what would that be like, though, if every OPEC member started flexing its power? Well, I think they, they all are to one extent or another. It's mm-hmm. just that some of them are very much un- still under America's heel. It's the ones that that have retained their sovereignty, separate from Washington, that like Iran, that that are able to do this, um, and and the others are just basically staying mum. But you know, um, the Iranians are sort of the replacement for for Alan Greenspan, who used to uh, mm-hmm. say something and then the markets would respond. Now the Iranians are the ones who say something in the That's market. That's beautiful. Uh, yeah, no, okay, that makes very good sense. But now I'm also seeing, too, as the U.S. has uh, tried and failed, and as it has in every other one of its uh, schemes lately, to uh, hurt Iran by denying it access to dollars for trading oil. And now we have uh, an Iranian oil bourse open, uh, and uh, India and Iran are trading. You know, So everybody's moving away from the dollar, which I have perceived as weakening dollar, also accelerating the price in uh, the, the price spike in oil as the dollar weakens. Well, you know, that's like saying, you've been a bad boy, no more financial poison for you. <laughs> Not very effective, I'm afraid. And, and, and uh, to me, and I, I, I don't know if you agree with this, but uh, I'm seeing a massive power shift from west to east. Well, I think the power is evaporating. I don't think that it's it's really shifting anywhere. It's just that nobody is really getting their way. None of the actors are getting their way. That's it's true. It's very stri- striking in the case of the United States, where it's just one embarrassment after another. But I wouldn't say that anyone else is doing much better. Okay, so... <clears throat> What senses do you have for what's imminent then? I, I see gas prices continuing just just to go insane all of next week, and uh, and th- th- this is going to be uh, much more devastating than it was in '08. What else do you see? Or- well, I'm, I'm I'm not very good at these sorts of uh, short-term bets, mm-hmm. but I think that there is a psychological shift happening, which is that um, the United States is getting hit from all sides. Mm-hmm. So everybody is going to pile on, and and so um, foreign policy will will cease to exist in the case of the United States. It it will simply be uh, reacting to one little crisis after another, and there'll be too many of them, and and the State Department and the rest of the bureaucracy will simply get overwhelmed, unable to control the message, untro- unable to control what's happening on the ground, and just basically repatriating people from one country after another. And I predicted that that would start happening quite a while ago, and the question is, how chaotic is that going to be? Yeah, okay. Um, the repatriation thing, I think, is very important. I think I touched on that, too, with you know some of what I was saying about Iraq a, a while ago. There's a lot of boundaries of, and, and borders in the world that were drawn for no reason having anything to do with political or with uh, natural reality, with actual reality. They, they were drawn for political and economic reasons. Um, and it is looking like, uh, I think you said on Max Kaiser that something like uh, we, we would have all of the stages happen at once. Um, but political collapse looks to be like pretty imminent as well. What do you think? Well, it, it's probably going to continue happening to one country after another, but the Libya pattern uh, seems to have choked on Syria at this mm-hmm. point. It, 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 so, yeah. um, you know, t- just talking to... Syrians I know, I asked them, well, there's all this turmoil in the news. How about in Syria itself? Is there anything going on? And they said, we have families in Damascus. There's nothing going on. Absolutely nothing. There's uh, one part of the country that is sort of foreign occupied. The government lost control of it. And now they're fighting back and retaking their own territory. That's what's going on. So, um, it's it's all the, all of this sort of um, you know fake stage managed 
pseudo revolution mm-hmm. that's supposed to be happening, and it's bogged down. What's and your... the thing is that uh, you know Russia and China screamed bloody murder when it was happening in Libya, right? right. But they didn't do much about it. Now they're actually doing. Something oh, they have about both it. put their foot down, and, I, and I'm, I'm 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 convinced that's because. Syria and Iran have a mutual defense treaty, and and the order of battle to attack Iran has to be to achieve re- regime change in Syria first. Uh, so the, the the line has been clearly drawn in the sand by the Soviets, by the, the Soviets, the Russians, the uh, Chinese, uh, and uh, Assad knows that he's not going anywhere. I wanted to ask your take on uh, we've had some massive demonstrations, uh, anti-Putin demonstrations in Moscow with uh, with. Russians uh, braving 20 below weather, linking arms, tens of thousands turning out. What's your take on all that? Well, there, there's a, a good side to Putin, and there's a bad side to him. Um, the good side is that he's actually managed to rejuvenate the country to a large extent, um, kept it together, under control, uh, dealt with some internal situations, um, was a bit rough on some people, but he's held it together, and, mm-hmm. and the country is much improved because of his efforts. That's the good part. The bad part is that he's a kleptocrat, and he pr- presides over um, an entire group of, of uh, kleptocrats. Some of them um, do actually believe in Russia, believe that Russia has a future, few of them. But many of them made this bad bet that by um, expatriating everything that they've stolen, putting it in Swiss banks, and buying real estate in London, and putting their children through Western schools and colleges will somehow get them another lease on life because they didn't believe in Russia. They, mm-hmm. they thought that by, by setting themselves up so that they're ready to flee, um, you know, they'll, they'll gain something. And that could turn out to be a self-fulfilling prophecy in their case. But it was a very bad bet because um, I don't think Europe is much more stable than Russia at this point. And in fact, I, it'd be I, I would say less. Home. Yes, I would say so they've made they've made a ba- bad bet, and and now they have to to make amends. Now they have to fix things. Mm-hmm. It's We're not clear on. that it's not clear how far along they are in realizing that you know they've made this really terrible bet. But you know, I, I hope that I hope that they move along. Well, I you know I I I, I admire Russia. I visited Russia, and and uh, the, the Russians are very no bullshit. We can say that on internet radio. Uh, in their in their foreign policy and 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 I find that very very reassuring. We're on tonight with Dmitry Orlov on the Lifeboat Hour at the Progressive Radio Network. Uh, really enjoying being here, watching our numbers expand uh, and having really good results. We play a song at our uh, at our nightclub at the end of the world every week. We have the perfect one tonight is Gasoline's. Uh, <laughs> what is it where you are? Four twenty six where I am. Five dollars in L A. Six dollars soon enough. That's just uh, that's just a part of what's going on. So tonight uh, from New White Trash, here is one of the songs I co-wrote and and uh, share the lead with Doug Lewis on. It's called Free Fall. <laughs> Trash, you're the new white trash. Trade the little for the new white trash. Say goodbye to the world. 
It does. That's a new white trash. That's free. The song is Free Fall. You can find all 37 originals at www.newwhitetrash.com. <clears throat> gotta have a little, you know, just gotta have some music here to make things go along. So we're here tonight with Dmitry Orloff from clubOrloff.blogspot.com. His latest essay, characteristic <laughs> Dmitry Orloff title, a, P- a Pile of Straw at the Bottom of a Cliff. What's that all about, Dmitry? Well, it's it's based on a Russian saying, which is, if I knew where I'd fall down, I'd put down some straw there. Mm-hmm. It's basically to to get the point across that it's it's ridiculous to try to prepare for the completely unexpected. Mm-hmm. But I, I use that facetiously in in the sense that, well, we we could possibly prepare for the completely expected. So why don't we? And uh, one of the things that we can foresee. Uh, we can study using mathematics and science is the fact that the end of the fossil fuel age is not going to be slow and gentle. It will be more of a cliff <laughs> dive. We're on tonight with Dmitry Orloff. It's time for station break at the bottom of the hour. If you want to ask Dmitry a question, the number is 1-888-874-4888. Uh, or you can email me directly at lifeboathour at collapsenet.com. 888-874-4888. We are going into the station break. We'll come back. We've already got some questions for the wonderful Dmitry Orloff. We'll see you in a second. become uh, an anthem for me, and that's going to fade out. Yeah, there we go. And uh, uh, it's a wonderful song. We're going to play it in full again on the show. It's, uh, it kind of kind of gives a whole new perspective and a whole way, a whole new way of looking at what's happening. Because on the one hand, we have uh, the the horrendous, devastating uh, heart attacks, if you will, that are happening all over the world in various forms and very various places. But there are very strong signs of an awakening and a, and a change of consciousness with which. Uh, Dmitry Orloff and I both hope to see come about by some uh, means, or cro- crooker means. Dmitry, we're back. Uh, we have an email from uh, Windermere Assassin, a.k.a. Lee Deathcare Nelson, who's a great friend of ours on Facebook and, and, and uh, everywhere around, and he's a regular, regular listener to the show from London. Uh, what a week, buddy. He writes, sheer craziness on a global scale, and here in the U.K. things are slipping down and hill fast. We have seen the possibility of doctors going on strike over government, government pension changes. I never even knew the doctors could strike, but then I've never really paid attention to current affairs until I watched a movie about a guy in a chair, lots of cigarettes, and plenty plenty of eye-opening revelations on the state of our world. So uh, when our rather camp good friend, uh, he was uh, Lee was uh, very much involved in Occupy London, uh, talks about Joe Rogan. I'm looking to see if there's a question. Um, he out. <laughs> Okay, this is a Dmitry Orloff question. I'm, I'm, I'm going to come down to the end. I know everyone can't be saved, and that's upsetting to say the least, but our friend is such a lovely person. This is a great friend of his. We want them to wake up and smell the coffee, but he just wants his cocoa instead. 
Since when is more sleep been the cure for a nightmare of epic nastiness? Since when has more sleep been, been a cure for anything, Dimitri? Well, the people who do the best are the people who care the least, it seems, in, in bad situations. Mm. Um, you know, there, there are a few people, that very small percentage of the overall po- population, who can think strategically and position themselves ahead of time and actually do it right, right. do it well. Most don't. Most don't even bother, and most shouldn't even try. Um, most people don't even have that, that uh, you know, that the ability, the, the resources and whatever else it takes. But what people do on a tactical level is really often unexpected. Mm-hmm. It's, it's sort of like climbing up a grease pole and running away from, from a lion. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't know that you'd be capable of it until the moment arrives. And you do it, yes. And we- so... It's we a have a caller. Make, oh, okay. Yeah. okay, go ahead. It's a bad idea to make bets in terms of who who will succeed and who will fail. Uh, people should be ready to surprise themselves. Absolutely, and there's going to be a lot of surprises, both both good and bad. We have a first time caller tonight, George from Orlando. Are you there? Uh, yes. Hi, Mike. Hi, man. Thanks for taking my call. Been a big fan of yours for forever, ten Thanks. years at least. Now, what I noticed though. Recently, I live in a retirement community in Florida called The Villages. The price of gas cans doubled in a week, as if almost someone suspecting that we're going to have gas problems going forward at all the Walmarts, all the Ace Hardwares, everywhere you go. The gas can that was 750 is now 1484. And I'm just I was a little perturbed about that and I was almost freaked out how someone can anticipate that the price, that the people would be demanding gas cans in the near future. Uh, there's a lot of people buying gas cans, uh, I would think. But I, I was just really shocked that the price almost doubled, almost overnight within a week. Well, uh, the, the lights are starting to go on. What what kind of, uh, uh, Dimitri? What kind of uh, panic buying would you expect to see? Well, actually, that's a beautiful pattern right there. That's American retail at its best. (laughs) What better way to sell more gas cans than to hike up the price of them? Everybody sees the price of gas cans going up, they talk about it, and they go out and they buy a gas can before the price will go up some more. It's beautiful. And here we start the vicious cycle. Uh, Dimitri, I just got a very disturbing email, and I want to share it with you. Uh, Bill sent this in, uh, and he said this is a link to a story, uh, U.S. to announce aerial blockade on Syria. This, uh, and it links to a Ynet, which is an Israeli publication. Very, They're solid. Uh, the headline does say, U.S. to announce aerial blockade on Syria, U.S. readies for possibility of intervention without U.N. resolution. Sharak al Aswat reports citing U.S. military official plan to include humanitarian aid to Syrian refugees on Turkey's border. And not, no, okay, but the first paragraph qualifies. The Pentagon is readying for the possibility of intervention in Syria. Uh, every time I see this, because to me it is it is so clearly, uh, if, if there is a, an attempt at regime change on on Syria, and, and I bet every last nickel I have on this. Uh, that it, it 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 will start a global global nuclear Armageddon. It's 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 the grand screw it moment of all time. Uh, but uh, every time I see a story like this, the hairs on the back of my neck stand up and I lose my appetite. Dimitri, uh, uh, what do you think would happen if uh, the U.S. acted unilaterally now to attack Syria? Um, I'm not sure, and I'm, I'm not sure that they would. Uh, yeah, you see, they, they have to justify their budget and their existence. So they have to act dangerous. You know, if they don't act dangerous, then their budgets don't get approved. So th- th- they're constantly in this posturing mode. But, you know, everybody knows that in many ways they're just sitting ducks. They're all over the place in many parts of the world. Mm-hmm. There's just so many ways to screw them that people are d- taking advantage of because why bother? Why, why attack a country that's busy screwing itself? Exactly. So, and, and, and doing a great job of it, too. And, yeah, and doing it real fast. So most of the world will, is, is, is likely to just sit back, and, and uh, the worst that'll, that might happen, and you know, this might actually be, be one of those game-changing events, is if uh, um, there's a lot of technology now to take out 
an, an, an American aircraft carrier. Mm-hmm. There, the Chinese have developed a ballistic missile system to do it, against which there's no defense. Mm-hmm. The Russians have developed a supersonic torpedo to do it, mm-hmm. sold it to, to the Iranians. So there are many ways to, to knock out aircraft carriers. So an interesting thing might be if that happened. That would be a very, very much a game-changing thing because that would change America's, um, I don't know what it is, but, but the, the idea that they can, they can project force wherever they want. In, in the meantime, uh, we have had over the last, the course of the last uh, two and a half, three months since uh, U.S. helos killed 24 Pakistani soldiers well inside Pakistan. Uh, and Pakistan shut off overland supply routes to the NATO troops in Afghanistan. Uh, the Russians said only non-lethal aid over convoy overland. Uh, uh, air base resupply was denied. The British have uh, announced an early pullout, and just a couple of days ago the Germans announced they are withdrawing from Afghanistan, which is important because the German command under ISAF is, is the northern provinces, uh, where which are... Taliban stronghold. Uh, Germany is pulling out. Britain and Germany clearly see the U.S. Uh, uh, getting its ass kicked and are getting their people out on time. What do, you think, what do you think the chances are of a lost legion there? Well, that's happened before. That's interesting. an interesting part of history. They, the British bled all the way out of Afghanistan when they lost it. And if it happened to the Americans, well, you know, it, it would be part of a pattern. Uh, Afghanistan is the place where empires go to die. Mm-hmm. It's it's very interesting. It's it's sort of it's very hard to figure out what compels them to do it. It's just that it's there. It's the center of Eurasia. It's the focal point. Uh, nobody has been able to conquer it or hold hold it down. It's a worthless batch of land that's uh, really impossible to attack, uh, even with all the modern weaponry. So if the United States follows the example of the British and then the Russians. It would it would just really show that there, there there's something at work. There's some principle conquering the the, the mindset of uh, empires. It's almost like empires are like insects mm-hmm. drawn to a flame. That there isn't actually any sort of a rational process behind them, which is very interesting. We have uh, lived through, of course, the uh, Soviet uh, invasion of Afghanistan in 1980. Uh, which turned out in the big fight with the Mujahideen, the, the uh, geographic uh, counterbalance to the, the Contra War in Central America. Uh, the Russians left, uh, I would think, with their with their uh, tail between their legs, certainly uh, having, well, you can categorize that. What do you think Russia's attitude would would be toward Afghanistan now, because Russia pays very close attention to the near abroad. Uh, Mother Russia keeps her chicks very close, and, uh, and 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 I think it's a very wise wise policy for her. But how does Russia treat what's happening in Afghanistan now? Well, Russia has a difficult time dealing with the the Muslim populations to the south. Um, a lot of them are moving in; they're migrating into Russia itself, and there's a lot of ethnic strife. In, in cities in Russia right now because of the burgeoning Muslim populations there. So um, it's a little close, too close for, for comfort for a lot of Russians, not just the people in the government, but mm-hmm. just like people everywhere resent the fact that there are Muslims everywhere, that they seem to be losing their country, losing the character of their country. And, and so there will be some politicians pandering to that. So there will be some uh, hot spots here and there flaring up. Um, and it, it can turn ugly in places. I don't think that there's going to be any sort of a great geopolitical change. I think the, you know, the higher birth rate of the Muslim populations is, is basically determining the outcome, mm-hmm. and, and not much can be done about it. Most of those people are living quite peaceably inside Russia. All right. Now, when you talk about uh, Muslim birth rates, and there are, I remember it from the wilderness, we did a lot of work, even Stan Goff did work on the resource shortages that are just horrendous throughout the the near Middle East. Uh, But we also see this massive Shia-Sunni conflict in Iraq, which my take is that the U.S. and the CIA and the Saudis are pushing the Sunnis, and uh, and everybody else in the world is favoring the Shias, but it is tragic to see that. What are the dangers around an Iraqi civil war right now? 
Well, I've always thought that Iraq is, is actually three different countries mm-hmm. that got mixed together. There's the Kurd portion, there's the Sunni uh, portion, and there's the Shia portion, portion, and they've been coerced together. And only a strong man like, like Saddam Hussein could hold it together. Um, and um, so it, 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 they'll probably just go their separate ways. I think these borders will, be, will become more or less notional. I afterwards. hope so. And and uh, that the populations will will recongeal in some um, in some other form, probably more geographically compact. Yeah, um, because one of the things that scares me is we have all this huge uh, global attention <clears throat> focused on the, on the on the on on the fault lines around Syria and Iran and Saudi Arabia, but then you also have this very bitter feud between Shia and Sunni between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And below that, you have all of these other uh, d- decades, uh, multi-generational feuds just between uh, smaller ethnic groups, uh, Hashemite, whatever, in, in the region who lament, you know, when somebody from the artificially drawn country of Syria took some land away from an artificially cut drawn country called Lib- uh, Lebanon. You know what I'm saying? And what I'm afraid of is that the Middle East might, might kind of just go berserk on its own. And well, that, yeah, it's the post-colonial pattern all over the place. It happens in, in so many places in the world. You know, the British Empire really excelled at turning people against their neighbors. And mm-hmm. That's how they rule, divide and conquer. And and so uh, that festers for a really long time. And uh, uh, sometimes it blows up. Um, it can, you know, these, these synthetic countries that, you know, basically were created by, you know, Churchill's pencil on a ruler on a map. Um, could only be held together by brute force, and when that is lacking for whatever reason, then things start to disintegrate rather rapidly. Yeah, and, and so the, as we look all around the world, I mean, here in the States as well, uh, and you know, at, at Europe, at, at anywhere, and all the places where there's uh, massive civil unrest, and that would include especially India, Pakistan, Afghanistan now, and South America's uh, doing some some uh, some nice uh, revolts now too. With all of this, I mean, uh, there's a berserk moment. You, you had coined the term about the aha moment when, when everybody goes, "Aha, this is all bullshit," kind of like. And 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 I'm I'm worried about the berserk moment when everybody just kind of loses sanity all at once. And I'm wondering how close we are to that. Well, I I think that you know parts of the U.S. are definitely close to a nervous breakdown. Parts of Europe are beyond that point. I think Greece is far beyond a nervous mm-hmm. breakdown. And I think this will be the year when, you know, it, it will be sort of like the late 1960s, where the entire planet briefly loses it. Now, you didn't see much like this in the, in the Soviet Union, but I, I was here in the U.S. In, in 1968. I was a sophomore in high school when uh, the uh, Democratic Party had their convention in Chicago at the height of the Vietnam War, and, and, and the SDS and the Weather Underground had surfaced, and... Uh, Chicago was an absolute bloodbath. Now I'm looking here at NATO and G8 and Occupy, and like everybody's going to Chicago. I think it's starting May 5th, and I'm pretty sure I'm going too because that seems to be a showdown on a high noon. Uh, I, I, I have no way to predict what could happen, but I do think it's kind of interesting uh, that uh, the president's first chief of staff, Rahm Emanuel, is now the mayor of Chicago, and the president, president's second chief of staff has just announced he's leaving to go back to Chicago. So that tells me the White House uh, has something very, very huge planned for that time around May. W- uh, do you have any sense for what might come out of that uh, of uh, Chicago? Yeah, well, Chicago is a very special place. I mean, look at Rod Blagojevich. He he went to prison for a long time for doing something completely legal. You know, he got arrested on a technicality, which is he, he lost a vacant seat. You know, you're not allowed to sell vacant seats. They have to be occupied by a senator or a congressman before you can sell them. <laughs> so that that was just like he violated a little tribal taboo or something. But, you know, that that's where the tribe is, and that's that's where they will go to their doom, I guess. I'm wondering what's, what's going to happen if you mix all this, all the cops that are going to be there uh, a very energized and active Occupy movement, uh, NATO, G8, uh, and Tea Party, I think. And, and so, not you know, throw Ron Paul into the mix, and you know, 
it's like something has to happen there. I, I can almost feel that. I'm kind of wondering uh, what's going to happen between now and then because I'm a little more concerned about immediate events. Well, uh, yeah, I'm wondering too. Uh, one thing I can tell you is I'll be nowhere near there. Yeah, but if you know my my commitment to Occupy, if I can be of service there, I will. Uh, you know, but uh, I, I think you're probably smarter than I am. How's your sailboat, man? Oh, it's fine. It's just fine. I, it's it's a whole different subject area. Um, um, I, I got an email yesterday that that I was very excited about. Sven Irvind, who the Swedish guy who circumnavigated the planet in a small boat, I don't know how many times, mm-hmm. went around Cape Horn in a 20-foot boat. Um, you know, he wrote to me, and so now we're corresponding about boats. And it's just it's completely separate. It's a different world onto itself. What will it like take? Uh, what will it take to make you cast off from where you are in Massachusetts? I don't know. I don't. I don't actually make predictions like that. But the thing is, I could cast off any time and come mm-hmm. back later. You know? I have a lot to learn from from uh, from hanging out with Russian experience. Uh, you know, I'm I'm too American in many ways. Because uh, uh, what was that line you said before about uh, Russians don't they wouldn't care about? What was that? It was a great line. Oh, the the the, the prevailing religion of Russia is something called Dufinism, or at least was not giving a rat's ass. Yes. And, and that's kind of the way you have to be, and that's kind of the way uh, the, the, uh, we are going to have to learn how to be. Um, well, yes, not not caring is actually very important. Um, caring about certain things is, of course, essential, but not in general, not caring about a great many things that don't directly concern you is. is a we just uh, we just posted a collapse net on the yellow bar up at the top recently. Uh, what, what I call the ultimate zombie litmus test. It's our friend. R- Richard Heinberg's new, new new video out of Post Carbon, and I forget the other filmmaker's name, but it was a, it was very well done. But it was explained so clearly. My attitude is that after watching it was, hey, show this to the person you love. Ask them to watch it once with their heart, and, and swear you'll never ask them again. And if after watching it, they they don't get what's happening, get a divorce, leave them, disown the children, whatever. Uh, you know. I, I'm having a strong sense that, 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 and I'm seeing a lot of people this way. Well, uh, you know, just to get away you, from anybody who doesn't get it right now. Well, let, let me give you a counterexample. What if I showed that video to my cat, and the cat reacted the way I would expect the cat to react? <laughs> uh, would I disown the cat? No, of course not. No. So, I think most people are in that category, same category as my cat. So exactly. I, will, I will still care about them, whether or not they appreciate the finer points of what they saw in that video, if they watch it, uh, because there's nothing they can do about that. There's nothing they, useful that they can do with that information. Mm-hmm. Well, when it comes to acting, if the cat has the ability to prevent you from doing something it, uh, that you needed to do, it, it, that wouldn't stop you, would it? I don't know. Uh, you, 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 uh, you owe an allegiance to people around you. It goes beyond utility or keeping safe. Or, and don't, yeah, th- th- and, those and, are. And that's probably more important. The thing is that you know surviving dishonorably is worse than dying honorably. Oh, absolutely agree with that. But th- that describes the horns of the dilemma that is, 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 that's going to be facing a great many people, uh, and, and that is facing a great many people right now. Uh, yeah, and, yeah, and, and they can't abandon those people who are close to them, who depend on them, whether or not those people actually understand what's going on. And uh, that's going to make for some very spicy living for a lot of people. That's that, that's why it's important to, uh, to know that the ones in your lifeboat are ones that you can really count on, that, that you're all focused on. The, I wouldn't let anybody into my lifeboat uh, unless I was prepared to care for them. Uh, as uh, as a crewman, though, uh, who who didn't share the same focus on on uh, what what the imperatives were and why they were important. Well, uh, yes, I mean, I think that that's an important point. Don't don't throw in your lot with people you're lukewarm about. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's that's an important piece of advice. Yeah. Um, the. Uh, it, it, it doesn't happen as much as it used to, but people are still throwing some of these absolutely ridiculous headlines about bailouts and stuff. There's this talk about this now $2 trillion thing from IMF. I mean, I'm tired of talking about it. Uh, 
I have interpreted all of the press stories about Greece and Apostle and all the dog and pony shows as as just delaying things. Uh, with Greece, uh, with a Greek default being inevitable, um, do, do you think that's the agenda for all these continued uh, uh, Kabuki performances, or w- what is it? Well, at some point, somebody uh, looks at the cash in their hand and and um, decides to spend it because uh, when will be the next chance to spend it? Um, there'll be um, Basically, it's, it's sort of a, like a, the, the way the way the collapse rolls is your, your opportunities to spend your money usefully dwindle over time. Mm-hmm. Because less stuff is getting made, less stuff is being shipped. Mm-hmm. The stuff that you can buy is lower and lower quality all the time. So at some point, money becomes less useful than stuff. And when that happens, the price of stuff skyrockets, and then all of this financial manipulation, basically money printing exercises, you know, keeping the flow of money going. Uh, stop working, and it's um, you know it's a sea change. It's something that happens. It's a, a mental flip, and and that's when you go from deflation to hyperinflation, <clears throat> which a great many people are seeing is uh, is pretty imminent. I mean, the dollar is weakening very rapidly, uh, and uh, many other avenues, little f- uh, fire exits have been opened uh, to, to allow uh, wealth to flee out of dollars. Um, I think that the uh, that the collapse of the dollar coinciding with or fed by the geopolitical collapse of the U.S. thanks to its Three Stooges foreign policy uh, is is going to be extremely fast, and I'm thinking hyperinflation probably maybe by this summer. I mean, leaving aside the date issue, it does feel like we're we're just a breath away from it, right? Well, it it could happen at any time. It's it's um, you know it's a panic and. It's- you know, I, I wouldn't want to predict a panic. Mm-hmm. You know, no, you know, never mind. You know, <coughs> you know it's, it's, it's the idea of actually triggering one is is abhorrent. Um, so I, I'd rather let let it let it flow the way it will by itself. Mm-hmm. But it's a big question in my mind: where does wealth go to die? Mm-hmm. You know, because it's all pieces of paper. People looking at each other, saying, "Are you, are you, are you good? Are you, you know?" I, can you come up with the goods on this, or or is this just a, a piece of paper? Right? I, I, I and, hope it's kind of like the Wicked Witch of the East. Well, I, yes, there's the I am melting moment that that, that we're all waiting for. When, yes. when all these rich people turn out to be rather helpless. Uh, the Admirable Crichton. That was a play I did a long, a long time ago in high school. Uh, yeah, well, uh, again, they have stocked up on hard goods, land, uh, all their survival gear, their guns, their... They have their their uh, castles and their castle keeps. Uh, they think stocked. Um, I, we'll see how that plays. I don't know. I I, I want to kind of spend uh, like the last few minutes on some of the upbeat notes. I opened the show tonight with this story about uh, the food forest in Seattle, uh, and to me that that feels like a cosmic move, uh, just a major moment in in. Uh, in history, um, are you that optimistic, or am I just looking for something to be happy about? I think that there are little islands of people in the United States that are just that are just amazing, you know, mm-hmm. and and uh, they they make up for the rest. This gigantic feckless population driving around in SUVs and pickup trucks, going from one retail outlet to another, um, living in homes around which nothing edible grows, mm-hmm. you know, going and going to the you know the, the supermarket and, and and buying mostly meat products mostly from factory farms that make them sick you know there, there's that pattern right and it's prevalent and then there are pockets of really awesome stuff going on mm-hmm. alongside it so what people have to do is look for those pockets of awesomeness and, and make them bigger that's that, that that's been my experience since uh, the movie came out collapse I mean I, I got to travel all over the country I got to Ma- Massachusetts Minnesota Vermont uh, California Washington Oregon and visiting these amazing little islands which which I have called arcs if you will which is a whole bunch of lifeboats tied together uh, with and and I really think that the number of of these places around the world is growing. We see it at CollapseNet every week. Our traffic is increasing, and, and, and we've been able to improve the site thanks to the help from uh, from all you guys out there. 
Uh, and I'm, I'm hopeful because I'm not the only one seeing what appears to be a looming change of consciousness. When you have the Wyoming state government passing a doomsday bill, acknowledging everything that you and I were predicting back in 2005, uh, that's kind of a watershed moment to me. Uh, what do we take away from seeing things like that, Dimitri? Well, we take away the fact that there, there are things worth doing. We shouldn't just sit on the sidelines. We should get involved. Mm -hmm. They feel good. And they're fun. Yeah. Dimitri Orloff, thank you so much, man, for uh, for coming back on the show again. You're you know you're you're an icon in in, in the movement. You're you're a good friend, uh, and you're one of the lights out there that I that I love uh, being on this planet with. I want to tip tip the hat tonight to to Matt Simmons. Um, uh, it was released it revealed this week that uh, there was very likely a third well leaking down at Deepwater Horizon, which is what Matt Matt was screaming about before his untimely death, which I do believe. Now, and I will say it, there's nothing left to lose with murder. But we make good good friends along the way, and uh, Dimitri's one of the best guys out here. Check him out. Follow him. Uh, Dimitri, we, we are going to get you back soon, and thanks for being with us again tonight. Thank you, Mike. All right. All right, all right to everybody out there, uh, I'll be back next week. Uh, we got some, some good things happening, uh, and uh, I will be on this. I expect a, a, a lot of big news this week. And we'll keep you abreast of it at CollapseNet. And you can find us, find me here, God willing, on the River Don't Rise on the Lifeboat Hour at prn.fm next week. Until then, I'll see you.